This is your 2015 Royal Rumble wrap-up here on the official YouTube channel for the Solomonster Sounds Off Wrestling Podcast, which drops each and every Sunday on the Solomonster.com, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and TuneIn Radio. I am the Solomonster. It is the day after the 2015 Royal Rumble, a show that by the time it was over had the hashtag cancel WWE Network as the number one trend on Twitter. And actually, as of this morning, I believe it is still, I don't know if it's number one, but it is still the top trend on Twitter. Hashtag cancel WWE Network. So you can imagine how most people felt coming out of this show. Uh, I cannot bring myself to give a show with a championship match like the one we had here a thumbs down. So I will go thumbs very much in the middle on this show. Uh, I've got a lot of thoughts on the Rumble match and how that whole thing went down, but when this show was over, I think the biggest shame was that on a show that had a championship match as freaking awesome as the one that we got between John Cena, Seth Rollins, and Brock Lesnar, early match of the year candidate, easily one of the best three-way matches that I've ever seen in WWE, at least, it's a shame that when this show was over, nobody was talking about that, and everybody was talking about the finish of the Rumble match, and not in a good way. And to me, above everything else, that was the biggest shame, because the real story coming out of this show should have been what a freaking awesome title match that was, and it wasn't, and that's not on the fans, that's on WWE. But let's take this in order. We'll start from the beginning. We'll go match by match. We'll start with the pre-show. We had... What was supposed to be an elimination match. It was supposed to be a six-man elimination match, but this is WWE. Plans change. So it turned into a regular tag team match. It was Kofi Kingston and Big E representing the New Day against Tyson Kidd and Cesaro. Uh, my guess is that boot that we saw on Xavier Woods' foot had a lot to do with this, but he had the boot on Raw. So, you know, if they knew he was hurt and the guy's wearing a freaking boot on his foot, I'm not really sure why they would go ahead and announce an elimination match that he would have to wrestle in, so they came to their senses, it turned into a tag team match, and to no one's surprise, Cesaro massively over in Philadelphia, they were in Philly, uh, which is one of the hardest of hardcore crowds that you can have, a lot of wrestling fans in Philly, I mean, you could say what you want to and use, you know, your, your derogatory terms, oh, the smarky crowd, you know, WWE should be should be fortunate that they have fans like the ones in Philly and, and other places like New York and Chicago that, that have as much passion for their product at a time when so few people have passion for WWE's product. And it's not hard to see why. So he was massively over in Philadelphia. The, the whole team was. Tyson Kidd was as well. The New Day, on the other hand, not very well liked. And why should they be? Again, I've talked about the New Day ad nauseum on my show. There's actually a Sound Off uh, extra video on this channel if you want to go back uh, talking about what is the problem with the New Day. They've done these guys no favors since they made their, their re-debut in this crappy gimmick. They've given us no reason to care about them. And so people didn't care. They booed them. Uh, thankfully, the right people went over here. Cesaro and Kid got the win. Uh, all I can say about this is these two fuckers, they need to stop connecting with the crowd. They're connecting with the crowd far too much for their push. You know, I can't let it go. Vince McMahon on, on Stone Cold's podcast, when they aired that on the network, talking about Cesaro, I don't know. You know, I don't know why he's not over. I don't know why he can't connect with the crowd. Maybe he's Swiss. That's why he's Swiss. So that has something to do with it. Must have been a lot of Swiss fans in Philadelphia last night. Must be a lot of Swiss cheese on those uh, Philadelphia cheesesteaks. We had the Ascension. Open the actual pay-per-view against the New Age Outlaws, The Ascension, another one, another act that has just been completely neutered since they debuted on the main roster. They, they, they were over in front of their little audience at Full Sail on NXT. They built up a little cult following for themselves down there. And as I've said on the Sound Off podcast before, uh, the, the thing with The Ascension is they were never that good. You know, they were built up as these big monsters because on NXT, you've got a lot of smaller guys. So, yes, they are some of the bigger guys on that roster down there at Full Sail. Now they're on the WWE roster that has guys like Kane and Big Show and, and even guys that aren't giants necessarily, but they're 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 so all of a sudden, they're not the biggest guys on the roster. So if you take their size away, Ask yourself this, what are you left with with the Ascension? If you take away their, their imposing size on NXT, what are you left with? Are you left with, with a tag team that 
has something else to offer that other tag teams don't, like the Usos? You know, what, what do they have that the Usos don't? Certainly not wrestling ability. And so they bring these guys up and they just put them in situations to be embarrassed week after week. And I can kind of see what they're trying to do here. You know, they had JBL for weeks on commentary just mocking and burying these guys. And for the first time here, this was the first time when this match was over and they won, they beat the Outlaws, as they should have in the opener, that we had JBL on commentary actually pay them a compliment. He actually had positive things for the first time to say about the Ascension, even though he destroyed them on Raw six days earlier. So the idea here seems to be, well, we're going to put these guys in the ring with legends who are over, <laughs> unlike the Ascension, and so we'll try to get heel heat on the Ascension by having them beat up the old guys that everybody loves. This will not work. Uh, the Ascension is just, you know, they're, they're a tag team on the roster, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, like I said, they're not that good. Connor in particular, I, I can't even really bash Victor, because Victor, Victor's not terrible, but Connor is awful. I just talked about this yesterday. On the sound off, Connor is awful. And for whatever, you know, they did with them, whatever your your thoughts on how they used them in that Raw reunion segment with the NWO and the APA last week and how it made them look like a couple of, of just nerds and goobers, the fact is this. Connor, at least him, Connor does not get a pass. You know, that, that goofy promo that he cut, yes, it's not his material, but Connor just is not that good. I've been saying that for months Going back to when they were cutting promos on NXT. He sucks. Some people just don't have it. And the Ascension, at least Connor anyway, falls into that category. I'm sorry to say it. If you're an Ascension fan, great. I'm not going to fault you for being an Ascension fan. But they've done these guys no good since they came up to the main roster. And they're not that good enough on their own to overcome it. But they're trying. Now, all of a sudden, they're trying. So they got to win over the Outlaws. Uh... You know, it, the old guys looked better in this match than the younger guys did. They were far more over, but I actually thought, you know, Road Dogg and Billy Gunn, for guys that are 50-ish or in their 50s or close to 50, look pretty damn good, I have to say. Uh, they look like they can have another short run if they wanted to give them one. I don't, I don't think there's a need for that, but uh, the Outlaws came out of this looking better than the Ascension did, but the Ascension got the win with their fall of man finish. We then had uh, the Usos against Miz and Mizdow, for the tag team titles. No singles matches on this show. It was all the Rumble match, tag matches. So we had another tag match here. This one was for the belts. And it was a good match. You know, nothing we haven't seen before. It's not like their, their first time encounter or anything like that. It was a good match, though, I thought, by the end. Uh, I thought everybody, you know, played their role perfectly fine. Miz Dow is great. Miz, I think Miz, even in this role. I'm not the, the biggest Miz fan in the world, but I think Miz is actually good in this role. The Usos are very good. All I can, you know, think to myself, and the people I was watching with who were just casual fans, it's not like they even follow this as closely as I do, but, you know, we're all thinking the same thing watching this. And the pattern in all of these Miz Dow and Miz matches is that Miz basically wrestles 97% of the match. Okay, if not, maybe sometimes 100% of the match. He'll tease doing a tag to Miz Dow. It's great heel heat when he pulls his hand away. But I wonder, you know, if we really think logically about this, and I know this is not something I should do while watching WWE, but if I try to be logical about this, why would Miz want to wrestle in a handicap match? You know, especially here, the championship is on the line, you want to win the titles back, and Miz just voluntarily puts himself in a position week after week, time after time, to take the whole match. He's basically wrestling a two-on-one handicap match voluntarily. Right? I would think that if I were a, a, a prick, selfish heel who wanted to get even even better heel heat, I would tag into Mizdow or, or, or shit, you know, let him wrestle most of the match. And then in the end, I would sneak in, you get the, the blind tag from behind or whatever, and sneak in and get all the glory and get the pin. Or, or hit my move and get the pin and get all the glory to myself, but let the other guy do all the work. But for some reason, this fucker, he seems to want to put himself in a position to wrestle handicap matches every week. So, sure enough, they lost. <laughs> the Usos retained the tag team titles. The other thing on Miz, I have to say this. You know, the, the Usos have their dives that they do in every match. Everybody in WWE is just dive crazy. Everybody does a dive. Brock Lesnar is maybe the only one who doesn't do a dive. Brock Lesnar and John Cena. Uh, although we, we have seen Brock Lesnar do a dive. If you, if you remember that first match back against Cena at Extreme Rules a, a few years ago, that scary bump that he took when he 
uh, had the steps in the ring and Cena was out on the apron. And I remember Brock just like jumped onto the steps, propelled off the steps into the air to hit Cena, but he overshot the ropes and Brock took a tumble to the floor. I thought he broke his neck. So technically Brock Lesnar uh, has done a dive, however unintentional it may have been in that match. Uh, but everybody does dives, and so the use of, and I keep saying somebody's going to get killed one day. Forget the fact that it's it's the most overused move in WWE. After the distraction roll up finish, are these dives through the ropes and over the ropes? But I think it was Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy did a dive at one point, and it looked like Miz, uh, or maybe it was Jay, but Miz was supposed to catch him or at least cushion his fall, and it it looked like Miz if he moved out of the way or just didn't catch enough of him but Jay hit the mat you know outside the ring just hit the floor I mean it looked and sounded ugly and I could see the referee went over to check on him and he was like yeah I'm okay but that was a scary moment but that's not the first time that Miz has done something like that you know Miz, Miz has a little rep for himself of for whatever reason I don't know if he's just afraid I, I don't think he's trying to hurt his opponent but it's not the first time that he has uh evaded somebody flying at him from over the top rope and allowed them to crash and burn on the floor. If you remember, that happened once with R-Truth, who I think actually did get hurt, and they actually took him away during the match. Uh, it may have happened one other time. So so Miz, you know, and, and that's not cool either because you're putting the other guy's safety in your hands, or the other guy is putting his safety in your hands. You're responsible for making sure he, he lands properly and doesn't, you know, get hurt or break his neck and not the first time that Miz has allowed somebody to crash and burn on the floor so that's that's not cool we had the Bella Twins against Paige and Natalia my diva stopwatch had this at just over eight minutes which is a lot of time for a WWE Divas match even on pay-per-view I, I thought this was a rough match I, I gotta be honest I didn't think this was really all that good it, it seemed like there were times when they were confused uh, there was one point, I don't know if Paige fucked up or somebody fucked up and didn't realize they were the legal person, so they had to come back into the ring. There was some confusion, like they got tied up on some spots. This was not the best showing. The Bellas are better than this. Paige is better than this. Natalia is better than this. This was not a good match. And and Natalia spent, I would say, a good 90% of the match in the ring being beaten up by the Bellas. Paige kept reaching for the hot tag, couldn't get it. Uh, it also looked, I don't know if the referee was trying to communicate something to Paige that was coming through his earpiece or if it was all part of the, the work, all part of the match, but I think he was trying to tell her, listen, hold on to that tag rope because Paige was, it almost like looked like she was forgetting to grab onto the tag rope in the corner uh, and had a, every now and then she'd go over and grab it, but then she'd forget again and she'd reach over the rope and try to get the tag, so I don't know what was going on there. Uh, but I think Bree came up from behind, yanked Paige off the apron when she was uh, searching for the tag. And I think it was uh, Nikki. I think Nikki kicked uh, Natalia in the head. Was it a kick? I, I gotta be honest. I really kind of zoned out for the end of this match here. But uh, I know that Nikki got the pin on Natalia and the Bellas got the win. So, there you go. Now we got to the good stuff. We had the return of the pre-Royal Rumble match interviews. Now, maybe I am out to lunch completely and they've been doing this the last few years. I don't have any real memory of them doing this, this gimmick the last few years. This is a very old school thing they used to do every single year, which was show guys in the back and get a little snippet from them, a little promo from each guy in the Rumble match on why they think they're going to win. Uh, I like this. This, this. this harkened back to... Uh, the old school when they used to do this, and it just makes the Rumble match seem that much more important. So they had you talk to Roman Reigns, and they talked to Rusev, Miz and Mizdow. They kind of teased a little bit of dissension there between the two of them. Uh, big Show, and they ended with Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan, not Roman Reigns, got the last promo here, uh, which is interesting considering how things played out later in the show. Then we got to the triple threat match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. Brock Lesnar, John Cena. And Seth Rollins. This match was fantastic in every sense of the word. Uh, I think adding Seth Rollins to the match, as I said a few weeks ago, was the best thing they could have done. I was not looking forward to John Cena versus Brock Lesnar. Oh, the rubber match. You know, we have to have the final chapter in this rivalry. No, we don't. Nobody was clamoring for another John Cena versus Brock Lesnar match. 
adding Seth Rollins at least added a new dimension to it. It was not the same match that we've seen a whole bunch of times before. You're taking a newer guy, you're putting him in there, and all of a sudden it creates some doubt. You know, now I don't know who's going to win this match. There's been a lot of rumors that Brock Lesnar may leave after WrestleMania. He may go to UFC, and so would they want to take the title off him now? I mean, whether he leaves or not, to me, that's I don't see how him being champion going into Mania or not really matters at all. I mean, just keep the title on him. You've built him up strong <laughs> over the last year. You had him beat Undertaker. He should go into WrestleMania and lose, whether it's to Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan, or whoever. I don't really see how him leaving should affect... You know, the mentality that, well, we can't have him as the champion going into WrestleMania. I never really understood that. But there was some doubt, you know, would the briefcase come into play? If Seth lost, would he immediately cash in? So I, I think it created a little bit of intrigue. But just as a match, it made the match ten times better. You can't tell me that coming out of this pay-per-view, John Cena and Brock Lesnar one-on-one -on -one would have had a match anywhere near as good as the match that we got last night. Uh, and Cena came out. He was so warmly received by the Philadelphia crowd. Uh, not, obviously. John Cena was was booed. I was going to say booed more than anybody else in the building, but <laughs> at least up until the Rumble match, he was. Uh, Seth Rollins came out, got booed, maybe more of a mixed reaction. Brock Lesnar came out, mostly cheered. Not hard to see why, given that they did a, a one-night babyface turn last week. I still didn't see that as an actual turn for Brock Lesnar like a lot of other people do. I think it was just a one-night a one-night deal, but there were still people cheering for him. I think they would have cheered for him anyway in Philly. And from the opening bell, I mean, the thing was non-stop action. One of the big spots in the match saw Seth Rollins deliver a, a picture-perfect flying elbow smash from the top rope, out of the ring, onto Brock Lesnar, who was laid out on the Spanish announce table. I mean, he could not have positioned this elbow any more perfectly than he did. He nailed it right in the center of this guy's heart. Uh, it was a great spot. So that took Lesnar out of the match for several minutes, and they really built this up like, well, Brock's really hurt, and they had uh, a stretcher come out, they had doctors tending to him, uh, and you know, it did create some doubt. I knew he was fine, because at one point on camera, you can clearly see Brock look over at either Paul Heyman or the referee, and I think he said something to the effect of, like, how much time, or, you know, he, he said something like, I could tell he was fine, but they tried to play it up that he had a bro at least a broken rib, so he was out of the picture. That left Rollins and Cena in there for a while to do their thing. We've seen Cena versus Rollins a million times. They have good matches, you know, pretty much every time out. Although, if this was just John Cena and Seth Rollins, again, that would have been kind of dull. Uh, but they had their few minutes in there to shine. And then Seth Rollins topped himself after the elbow smash earlier. And this <laughs> it just goes to what I said before. Imagine this match without Rollins. So Rollins goes up to the top rope. He's desperate. He's a ton of near falls between him and Cena back and forth. He doesn't know how to finish this guy off. He's looking at Cena. He looks at the ropes. He's looking at Cena. He looks at the ropes. So he climbs up to the top rope, and he pulls out a Phoenix Splash, which is, I mean, picture Adrian Neville doing the Red Arrow. It's, it's a spectacular move in the same vein, maybe even more impressive. I mean, this guy did so many flips and rotations in the air. Again, Landed right on top. It looked like he landed on top of Cena's, uh, like his groin, like right in his midsection. But Brock Lesnar did not waste any time. As soon as he landed that move, he lands the Phoenix Splash. There's Brock Lesnar sliding into the ring. He grabs Rollins, and he didn't even do like a double take. He grabbed Rollins around the waist, picked him up, and in one motion, just put him right back on his head and shoulder with a German suplex. Just obliterated the guy with this move. Uh, it was awesome. Brock got his second wind. He was screaming. The fans were going crazy. Uh, so then we see some stuff with... Uh, oh, no, he gave... I believe he gave Cena a German suplex. Rollins came back in, and uh, he went to give Rollins... I think uh, Brock went to give... Did Brock go to give Rollins an F5, or was it Cena who tried to give Brock... Uh, who tried to give Rollins an FU? I, <laughs> it's, it's practically the same move. I get confused. But Rollins landed on his feet, grabbed the briefcase. Cena was already taken out of the picture here. So it came down to Rollins and Brock. And Rollins grabbed the briefcase, walloped Brock right in the head with it. Brock got right back up. So Rollins hit him again with the briefcase. Brock was still not out. So Rollins takes Brock's head, places it on the briefcase. Now he's going to do a curb stomp, and he's going to finish this guy off once and for all. He's going to curb stomp Brock's head right through the briefcase. But as he hits the ropes and comes off, Brock scoops him up into an F5, an enormous F5, just pancakes this guy right on the mat. Rollins is laid out, just splattered on the canvas. 
and he rolls him over and gets the three count, and the place goes nuts. This was a fucking great match. And if you are one of the people who did legitimately cancel uh, your WWE Network subscription, didn't see the Rumble, though, hopefully the people who canceled their subscription were at least watching the show, so they got to see this awesome match. If you are one of the people who did cancel your Network subscription, but you were not watching the show and you did not get to see this match, you really missed out, because this will... Uh, by the time this year is over, it's still January, so, you know, who's to say? But uh, early match of the year candidate, easily. One of the best triple threat matches I've ever seen. And WWE, there have been a few of them. I'm not a huge fan of these multi-man matches, but, like, my favorite, for example, three-way match in WWE was a match from 2002. They did it Vengeance that year. It was The Rock, The Undertaker, and Kurt Angle. It was the best triple threat I've ever seen in that company. Because there's a certain formula that you follow, right? Because... One guy goes down for a while. He kind of lays there. So the other two have their, their time to shine and go at it. And then eventually somebody else gets laid out. The other guy comes in. They kind of did that in this match when Brock got laid out. But they they had enough action in this match. And the way this whole thing was laid out, it was it was practically perfect. Uh, and the way they just they booked this match was so great. And the fans were, were into it from start to finish. Uh, but that I think of that match from 02. I think, obviously, last year's WrestleMania. You know, not a fan of, of having multi-man matches in the WrestleMania main event. But those guys pulled it off. Can you imagine Batista versus Randy Orton? Had they kept that as the original match? I mean, what, what, a, what a stinker that would have turned out to be. You put Daniel Bryan in there. You put a guy in there who knows how to work. Not that the other two don't. But a guy like Bryan who can go in there. You can beat him up. And, and you can do things with him that maybe you can't do with guys that are bigger. And it was a recipe for an excellent match. By the time that match was over, people were chanting, this is awesome. And so that that also, I think, goes down as one of the better triple threats in, in company history. And then you think of Triple H and Shawn Michaels and, and Chris Benoit at WrestleMania 20, which, which doesn't really get talked about now for obvious reasons. So this is up there with all of them. I don't know if I'd put this at, at the number one spot, but this was that good. And uh, this was just awesome. I have nothing bad to say about this match. And the right guy went over. You know, going into the show, I said, I, I thought John Cena was winning it. I'm happy I was wrong. But I just could not shake this feeling that John Cena's walking out with title number 16 and they're going to do Cena reigns or they're going to do, you know, they're going to do a match like that at WrestleMania. Brock Lesnar retained the championship. He is going into WrestleMania unless Rollins cashes in on him between now and then, which is possible. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but Brock is going to WrestleMania with the title as he should. The way they built this guy up as a human wrecking machine all year, and he ended the streak, and he obliterated John Cena at SummerSlam. When it comes time for this guy to lose, it needs to be at WrestleMania, and it needs to be in the WrestleMania main event. So even though I was wrong in my prediction, I was more than happy to be wrong. The right guy went over here, and I just give this match a total thumbs up. Which brings us to the 30-man Royal Rumble match. The Royal Rumble, for me, as I know it is for a lot of you guys, one of my favorite events all year. Maybe my favorite. Okay, and that goes back to when I was a kid. I've been watching this 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 company since the 80s, as many of you have. So I've seen every Royal Rumble multiple times over. As a kid, it used to be a fun time for me. You never knew who was going to come out, who was going to win. It was always a lot of fun. Now I'm a lot older. Still enjoy the Rumble, but when I look back on the last few years of Royal Rumble matches, it has been years since we have had what I would consider to be a really good Royal Rumble match. Some have been okay. A lot of them have been very disappointing. Some of them have flat out sucked. Unfortunately, this one falls into the latter category. Uh, this one, when this was over, all I could do is sit there and go, what a waste. What a waste of a Royal Rumble match that we only get once a year. It's not like they do these all the time. You get one Royal Rumble match a year. You would think that these people would get it right. But they continue to shoot themselves in the foot. And this isn't even about Roman Reigns winning the Royal Rumble. Which I, you know, I went with Roman Reigns as my prediction. I said it yesterday. My head tells me Roman Reigns. My heart says Daniel Bryan. I'm going with my head. I'm going with who I think is going to win, which is Roman Reigns. And sure enough, Roman Reigns won the Royal Rumble. I can't even be angry about that. I'm not going to sit here and rant and rave because the guy I wanted to win didn't win, okay? It's not about that. It's about so much more than that, which is what we're going to talk about here. It's about, from start to finish, the booking of this Royal Rumble match, the layout of this Royal Rumble match, the things they did with some of the key guys in this Royal Rumble match was flat-out idiotic. 
I mean, it, it can't be this hard. It cannot be this hard to book a Royal Rumble match. I am not a booker. I am not a writer. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I can do their job better than they can. Maybe, maybe sometimes. Okay, I'm not saying that. But this is a company. This was what, number 28? I think this was the 28th Royal Rumble event. There have been 27 other Royal Rumble matches. Guess what? A lot of those 27 Royal Rumble matches were pretty damn good. In fact, some of them were excellent. So it's not as though they're incapable of having a really good Royal Rumble match that has, you know, different stories that are told in there and, you know, has a, a fun climactic finish. In every measure, every, every way that you would measure this as a Royal Rumble match of what you would want to see in a Royal Rumble match, what would go into a Royal Rumble match, they failed. They failed on every single level. And what they did, and I feel bad for Roman Reigns, I don't know where all the Roman Reigns hate came from other than people, they perceive him as the chosen one, which he is. You know, he's their hand-picked guy. If you didn't know that before, you know that now. But just because he's the hand-picked guy doesn't mean he's necessarily, you know, a bad guy or that it's even the wrong move to make. Roman Reigns is going to be the face of this company for years to come. So whether you like it or not, you better get used to it. And I think he'll grow into the role. But, you know, I agree with those people who look at a guy like him and say, man, you know, here's a guy who can really benefit from having a little more time. When you really think about it, he hasn't been in WWE on the main roster for that long. You know, the Shield came on the scene at the end of 2012. So really, it was the beginning of 2013, all of that year, all of last year. Now it's the beginning of 2015. That's only a few years. So uh, would you really be killing the guy, let's say, if you waited another six months, if you waited another year to pull the trigger and, and put the title on him and give him that WrestleMania main event? Because right now, he's not ready for that spot. And you have at least one other guy on the roster, in Brian, who the fans are still into. It's not like he came back after nine months away and the fans are lukewarm to Daniel Bryan. Somehow, they're still into this guy. They're still chanting yes. They're still chanting Daniel Bryan's name. You know, it's not just like the chant is over. The guy is over. The people want to see him. The, the, the story is there. You know, that's why I wanted to see Bryan win. I mean, I like the guy. But it's not like, you know, I'm not like a, a Daniel Bryan nut hugger who he has to win every single match. And Daniel Bryan should be the champion. He should beat CM Punk's title reign. I've never said that. I look at this and say to myself, all right, what's the story here with Roman Reigns? Roman Reigns came back from an injury a few months ago. And he declared himself to be the first entrant into this year's Royal Rumble. And I'm going to win the Rumble. Okay, pretty basic shit, right? Well... They decided we're going to help get Roman over and make him look strong by programming him with The Big Show. And haha to all the people who actually thought they were doing something with Eric Rowan. I told you from day one they weren't. And some people insisted, well, you know, Eric Rowan is only working with The Big Show to help get Eric Rowan over. No, Eric Rowan worked with The Big Show to help get Roman Reigns over. Because Eric Rowan does not factor into plans because Eric Rowan is a mid-card guy at best. So they have the Big Show beat the crap out of Eric Rowe and beat him a couple of times. Somehow that's supposed to make the Big Show look stronger as he feuds with Roman Reigns, as though beating up Eric Rowan is some great accomplishment. The Big Show has been around since 1999. If you want to count the WCW days, he's been around since 1995. This is 2015. That's 20 years that this guy has been on top on television. From day one when he made his debut, his very first match was against Hulk Hogan. He has been at the top since day one. Now at times he's been knocked down the card, he's been in and out of the company, but for the most part he's been a top guy for 20 years now. And people can't understand what, where's all the hate coming from? Where's all the hate coming from? Because people are sick and tired of seeing guys like The Big Show and Kane. The Big Show and Kane were the last two men in the ring, I guess Rusev as well, but they were the final four in the Royal Rumble this year with Rusev and Reigns, Big Show and Kane. You can't understand why some people might be upset about that? And now, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's, let's backtrack here. We're going to go from the beginning until the end. I'll get back to this in a second. The Royal Rumble match opened with Miz and R-Truth. And you ask yourself, why the hell would they open with Miz and R-Truth? It would become obvious when number three came out. Uh, number three was Bubba Ray Dudley. So make that prediction number three that I made. 
earlier in the year on the sound off when I uh, I spit that name out there. I said, hey, Bully Ray's going to be in the Royal Rumble. And uh, people said, well, why do, you, why do you think that? And I said, I don't really have any reason to think that. <laughs> I have no inside knowledge on it. I just have a feeling that, you know, Bully Ray, Bubba Ray, call him whatever you want, is going to be a surprise entry in the Royal Rumble. And I said NXT would start touring outside of Florida, which they've already started doing. And, you know, Brian would come back early. At that time, it was still very doubtful that he would be back. And I said, Brian will be back before Mania. And he was. So, you know, so far, so good on that. So Bully Ray comes out as Bubba Ray Dudley in the old Bubba Ray outfit, the, the camo gear, the glasses with the tape in the middle. And they're in Philadelphia, ECW country. So everybody goes nuts. Uh, It's his first time in a WWE ring in 10 years. I can't even believe it's been that long since the Dudleys have been in there. But, yeah, it was 10 years ago when they left the company. And apparently his first Royal Rumble match. So for all the time he spent in WWE, which really wasn't that long. You know, I guess it was really from 2000 to 2005. He was never actually in a Royal Rumble match. Uh, If that stat is true, I, I find that hard to believe. But that's what they claimed. So he gets a monster reaction uh, he goes in there, and it became obvious why our truth was out there because Devon was not there, and they wanted to do the spot. They wanted to do two spots, so they did the uh, the was up spot, headbutt from the top. Our truth was in the role of Devon, and then they did a 3D. So basically, they put our truth out there as a substitute, <laughs> substitute one black guy for another. That's nice. So. Bubba Ray was uh, mixing it up with Luke Harper, some stiff clotheslines in there. That that could be a an interesting match down the road if they uh, if they wanted to pull that one off. I I'm honestly and I'm not even sure if Bubba Ray is back or not full time. I'd have to assume he's back with them, not just for one night. Uh, I would be very surprised if they brought him in for one you know one event and and let him get that kind of big reaction. Um, you know, just because they're in Philadelphia and then let him possibly go back to TNA, I can't imagine that. So my guess is that he's back with them, but I don't know for sure. Uh, it was nice to see him. You know, here's the thing. I, I, I'm not criticizing, but I, I will say this. If he is back, if it was just a one-night thing, then it's not a big deal. That was the old Dudley gimmick. They were in Philadelphia. It was a nostalgia thing, then fine. If it wasn't just for nostalgia and he is back with WWE... I hope to God they get him away from that gimmick as quickly as possible. Because if they brought him back just to be fucking Bubba Ray Dudley again from fucking 1999, that would be the biggest mistake they could possibly make with this guy. I mean, this guy went to TNA. He completely reinvented himself. He slimmed down, called himself Calfzilla. You know, he got himself in really good shape and completely reinvented his whole character, his look, everything about him. For WWE to bring him back and put him right back in the camo gear with the fucking glasses as Bubba Ray Dudley to me would be completely stupid. I mean, it would be idiotic for them to do that. So, if he's back, hopefully they got the nostalgia pop out of their system. Maybe they were worried, oh, people won't recognize him, which is stupid. Of course they would. If it was a one-night thing, then fine. If he's back, please, for the love of God, do not make him the old Bubba Ray Dudley. Call him Bubba Ray if you want, but let him be more of the Bully Ray character that he was in TNA. You know, I mean, just because it was a TNA thing doesn't mean that you can't let the guy do it in WWE. Because he could be a guy, I I don't want to say he'll be wrestling for the world championship, but I could see, you know, if he's playing that Bully Ray type character, I could see a Bully Ray John Cena feud down the road. I could see Bully Ray and, and, and Dean Ambrose. I mean, there's a lot of guys on that roster, I think, that he could work with, have some good promo battles with. If he's just goofy old Bubba Ray Dudley, then, you know, it's it's just stupid. It's a waste. I think it's a waste of the guy's talents if you if you do that. Next guys out in order were Luke Harper, who I mentioned had a little uh, back and forth with Bubba Ray. Bray Wyatt was out next. And then it was supposed to be Curtis Axel, NXT's own Curtis Axel. He got taken out by uh, Eric Rowan, who, if you remember, lost to Luke Harper on SmackDown, so he was not going to be in the Royal Rumble match. He decided to take Axel's spot. I guess the same way that Edge once took uh, Kofi Kingston's spot in an Elimination Chamber match. And so he got in the ring. We had the old Wyatt family back together, all in the ring at the same time. They did a little tease of an alliance with Harper and Rowan that the fans actually popped huge for. And then Rowan went to attack Bray, and Luke turned on Rowan. So it was actually a uh, a double cross, or a, a double double cross, I don't know. But all I could think watching this, and listening to the fans is 
what a mistake. You know, what a mistake it was to break these guys up. It, it's one of the great, I think, uh, bungled decisions of 2014. Uh, I can't really say that about the Shield, as, as uh, devastated as I was to see them break that unit up, because at least Rollins has really parlayed that into something big. And I guess Reigns, too, since he's going to WrestleMania. Uh, poor Ambrose is the odd man out here. Which is funny to me, because I still think that Ambrose is probably the guy who uh, is, is, in the end, has the most potential to be the biggest star out of all of them. But I can't really fault them for that. You could say they broke the shield up a little earlier than they should have. There was still more money to be made as them as a babyface group, but whatever. The Wyatt family, though, there was no reason at all to break those guys up. And uh, it was kind of sad watching them in the ring here and, and listening to uh, the crowd reaction to it. But... Anyway, they gave Bray Wyatt the diesel spot this year from 94, which is he dumps a bunch of guys out. He ended up with six eliminations, which was not the record this year. It just tied him with Rusev and Roman Reigns. The Boogeyman was another surprise. Who cares? Diamond Dallas Page was the other, I think he was the only other surprise. It was really uh, Bubba Ray, the Boogeyman, and DDP. There were no NXT guys in the Rumble this year. Randy Orton, who was apparently at the building, probably ready to go was not in the Rumble match. Sheamus, who's been out with an injury and is ready to come back, he was not in the Rumble match. There were no other major surprises, so uh, kind of a letdown. I mean, it was good to see DDP out there. He he threw out a couple of diamond cutters, which was kind of cool. I was Selfishly, I was kind of hoping Randy Orton would be the next guy out. It was timed perfectly, too, because he laid some guys out with diamond cutters, and then the countdown started. And they showed DDP looking at the countdown clock, and I think it was Rusev who came out. But I was thinking to myself, I wonder if they'd send Randy Orton out there for the big pop and then he ends up laying out DDP since he, you know, he, he took DDP's move. He lays out DDP with his own move and then dumps him out. But uh, it was Rusev and not Orton. Daniel Bryant entered the Royal Rumble. Monster reaction number 10. He comes out and runs wild and he had some interaction in there that was actually a lot of fun with Tyson Kidd. And... It was appropriate that Daniel Bryan entered the match at number 10 because that's exactly how long he lasted in this match. A whole 10 minutes he lasted. And then came the elimination. So what what's so mind-boggling to me about this, it's not just the fact that he lost. Again, I don't want people to listen to this review and come out of it thinking, well, you and everybody else are just upset because your guy didn't win. Okay, because that's such a simplistic fucking answer. Some people are very upset that Daniel Bryan did not win, and that's why they're ranting and raving. I'm trying to go above and beyond that and explain to you people why it, it goes so far beyond that. Okay, So Daniel Bryan is eliminated by Bray Wyatt. Now I think what happened was Rusev actually uh, maybe backdropped him over the top rope. He landed on the apron. But then it was Bray Wyatt who ran over, clobbered Bryan, and he just he fell to the floor. And that was it. It was a very uneventful way for one of your top baby faces in the entire company to be eliminated from a match that a lot of people had him pegged to win. So it wasn't just that he got dumped, it was when he got dumped and how he got dumped. Just in every sense of the word, this was like a nothing elimination here. And it, it, in a way, it kind of reminded me a little bit of Shawn Michaels back in 2010. I hope I'm getting my timeline right on this, but if you remember when they were building the story to Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker in that rematch at WrestleMania 26, the story going into it was Michaels was obsessed he was obsessed, I think, with getting uh, a championship match at WrestleMania. I think that was the story. And he went into the Rumble match, and he was super kicking dudes. I think he may have even eliminated Triple H, and that was one of the big spots in the Rumble match. And people, I don't know how many people realistically expected Shawn Michaels to win, but he got eliminated. And I think he may have been eliminated by Batista. Like, he was holding on to the rope, and Batista hit his hand, and he let go, and he fell to the floor. And there were a lot of people who booed and were very upset, and in a way, as big of a star as Shawn Michaels was when and how he was eliminated in that match, this, this reminded me of that a little bit. But you can excuse that. That actually made total sense because there was a long-term story that was playing itself out with Shawn Michaels that was leading to a match with The Undertaker at WrestleMania. You know, and they even they zoomed in on Shawn's face and they showed how dejected he was and how upset he was. There was a story that was ongoing at that time and you kind of knew where it was headed. He had, a, he had a path to WrestleMania. That turned out to be the last Royal Rumble match he would ever be in uh, since it all culminated in his retirement at WrestleMania. I think the biggest problem I have with Daniel Bryan and what they're doing with him 
is the fact that they don't appear to have any sort of real direction with him at all. And that was the same case last year. And I, I was so happy in that interview he did with, I think it was Alternative Nation, or some website interview he did recently where it was the first time I've heard him, him himself, publicly admit that as far as he knew, the plan for him at WrestleMania last year was like a match fifth down the card, I think, against Sheamus. They, they had no plans at all for him to even be sniffing the championship in the main event of WrestleMania. And then the fans revolted and CM Punk laughed and it was this extraordinary series of circumstances that just led to this perfect storm and I think made WrestleMania so much better than it would have been otherwise. Here we are now in 2015 and I feel like we're right back in the same boat where they don't have any real plans for Daniel Bryan. At least then they seem to have this this match with Sheamus that they wanted to do. Uh, that's what Bryan said and they didn't do it and it, it makes me <laughs> very worrisome now that I look at this. And I see, now that the Rumble is over, we can kind of see where they're going with WrestleMania. It's going to be Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. It's going to be Rusev and John Cena. Again, we'll get to this in a second. Uh, the, the rumors are that The Undertaker may come back for another match, and if he does, that's why they've been keeping Bray Wyatt so strong. I mean, Bray didn't win, but Bray looked pretty damn strong in this match, and he's been beating everybody. He beat Bryan on Raw in his first match back. He beat Dean Ambrose pretty much every fucking match they had. So it could very well end up being Bray Wyatt and The Undertaker at WrestleMania. You look at, let's see, who else is there? You've got Sting and Triple H. I think that match is a lock. And you've got possibly, what, Randy Orton and Seth Rollins? Orton's not back yet. Their issue is, is unresolved. It was, it was Rollins and Storyline that put Orton out with an injury. I could see them doing that match at Mania, maybe even having Rollins lose but then cash in at the end of the show. So that's, what is that, four matches right there? Four, five matches? So... Where does Daniel Bryan fit into any of these matches? Where does Dean Ambrose fit into any of these matches? The guy is is so much more over than his push. At a time when they don't really have as many stars as they used to have, and I can't remember the last time there was a guy on this roster, I don't even know if CM Punk would fall into this category, who, ha who was as over with the crowd, and the people were so hell-bent on seeing this guy succeed and seeing this guy on top as the champion, you know, in the WrestleMania main event, winning the Royal Rumble, as big of a star as CM Punk was, I can't remember even him having this level of support from the fans. I mean, I said it before, I know this was Philadelphia, but when Daniel Bryan came back, the crowd in whatever fucking city in the Midwest they may have been in could have been very indifferent towards him. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's Daniel Bryan, it's the GOAT guy from last year. Because again... You know, fans move on very quickly. Wrestling fans are very fickle. And and some people have very short attention spans, short memories, okay? You're, you're, you're on top of the world one day, and you're at the bottom of the heap the next. And for whatever reason, Daniel Bryan came back, and he was still over like Rover. People were still cheering for him. They were going, yes, 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 Daniel Bryan. Run with it. Embrace it. Be thankful that you have somebody on your roster that's that over, because you don't have very many people like that. At least... The guy should have a meaningful, important match on the biggest show of the year. Maybe he will. Maybe he will. But I'm looking at the media card after last night, how it appears, you know, the direction it all appears to be going in, and it just seems like, you know, Vince McMahon, you know, the fans, fuck you. We have our plans. You're not going to fuck up these plans again. You got what you wanted last year against our will. We gave you what you wanted which was not the plan, this year, you're not getting what you want, deal with it. That's kind of the attitude I'm seeing here. There were tons of people last night tweeting at me, why does WWE hate their fans so much? You know, and I wanted to respond and say, come on, they don't hate their fans, you're exaggerating. But when I thought about it, I said to myself, you know, I can't say that. I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I'd like to think they don't legitimately hate their fans. I know they don't hate our money. God knows they want you to subscribe to that fucking network. But you know what? When I look at WWE, what they're doing in terms of the booking, but also in terms of other things that they're doing, I'm not so sure they don't hate their fans. You've got the Three Stooges on commentary now every single week, and they did it again last night. They may as well just come out and say it. You people that don't subscribe to the network, who pay $55 for this shit, you people are fools. That's essentially what they say every single time they go on the air. They did it again last night. Before the pay-per-view went on the air, they had JBL. I don't know why the I don't know why you would pay fifty-five dollars for this show. Just subscribe to the network now. Look, I agree. If you have access to the network and you can get the Royal Rumble for nine ninety-nine, 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend $55, but you know what? People have their reasons. Maybe some people can't get the network. Maybe they live in an area where their internet is shit. So streaming the Royal Rumble is going to create nothing but problems. I can tell you, when I watch these pay-per-views, I go over to a buddy's house of mine, and for the last couple of months, there's been a lot of issues. And we've missed, you know, the, the, the feed breaks up, he's got to run upstairs, grab his router, hardwire everything together because the Apple TV craps the bed on us. So he had to go and pay $5 extra a month to his cable company now to upgrade his internet, and the show last night was flawless. There was not a hiccup the entire the, you know, the entire time, but I could see where some people, you know what, they may just not want to put up with it. They know that if they pay $55 in HD for their pay-per-view through their provider, it's not going to crap the bed, it's not going to buffer, it's not going to break up, it's not going to get pixelated. Whatever the reasons are, why would you insult your audience? Maybe they really do hate their fans. They're, they're, there's evidence of it. They're practically insulting the people who are paying $55 for their pay-per-views. Just because you want them to subscribe to the network doesn't mean that you should go on the air and basically mock them. So when people tweet stuff like that to me, I, I, as much as I want to say it's not true, I'm not so sure. Because you can point to different examples of WWE essentially telling their audience, hey, fuck you. And last night was a great example of it. But to go back to the Daniel Bryan thing, I, I, it's not just that he lost. It's that there seems to be no direction, and the way they booked this match just left me scratching my head. Why in the world would you get rid of Daniel Bryan that early in the match unless the, the, the attitude was, okay, we have a problem here. The problem is that we booked this guy in this match, and we're in Philadelphia, and we're really worried that if he gets eliminated, the people are going to shit all over this Royal Rumble match, just like they did with Batista last year. Once they realized Bryan wasn't in at number 30, that was the end of it. They, they turned on Rey Mysterio, they turned on the whole match, they turned on everything. We can't have that, so let's get Brian out of this match really early, and that way people can boo, and they can they can hiss, and they can get it out of their systems, and by the time the match comes to an end, you know, it'll all be out of their system, and all the booing will be over. I mean, if they honestly thought that, then they are a bunch of dumb motherfuckers. That's all I can say. Because I'm sitting on a couch watching this show at home, and I could, I could tell exactly what was going to happen. The moment he got eliminated, and the way he got eliminated, I knew exactly what was going to happen. They must have known that something was going to happen. That's the only reason The Rock was there. They practically had to go to The Rock and probably beg him and say, listen, we need you there to give Roman the endorsement. So The Rock shows up, and you saw what happened. Things did not exactly go according to plan. If that was the attitude, let's get Brian out early so that people can get it out of their systems and everything will be okay in the end, these people are even dumber than I thought. These people are truly clueless. If that was the thought process behind how they handled this guy in the Royal Rumble. Why even put him in there? I mean, <laughs> why even put the guy in there? I was saying before, you know, the guy should have a story. Whoever the, the winner is going to be, right, should have a story. The only story with Roman Reigns is, he got a hernia, he was out for a couple of months, he came back and said, I'm going to win the Royal Rumble. That was it, that was the story. With Brian, he came back, he had a, a much more serious injury, he was out for a much longer period of time was still over when he came back, put his name in the hat, said, I'm going to be in the Royal Rumble, I'm going back to WrestleMania, I'm winning back the championship, that, by the way, he never lost, he never got beaten for, so there, that's another part of the story that seems to have been forgotten in all this. The guy never lost the title, he had it taken away from him. I, don't, I haven't even heard the announcers bring that up. Not one time have the announcers brought this up. And the other added thing with the story that, that would make it a, a really good one is the fact that this guy had to basically run the gauntlet. I mean, he had to beat Kane on SmackDown. They made such a big deal about this whole thing. Kane beat him, and then... Oh, no, I'm sorry, he may have beaten Kane on, on uh, that first SmackDown match. But then they made a rematch, and the stipulation was that Brian would be out of the Royal Rumble match if he could not beat Corporate Kane. So they actually had his Rumble spot on the line in this match, hanging in the balance. He beat Kane... It was a big, big victory for him on SmackDown last week, so he was in the Rumble. And then they put him out there at number 10, they give him 10 minutes, and they have Bray Wyatt knock him off the apron. And he never showed his face again. He just walked to the back, and that was it. I'd like to say we never heard from Daniel Bryan again. We certainly heard his name quite a few times for the rest of the show. And I just sat there thinking to myself, I, I, 
I can't believe this. I cannot believe they thought this was a good idea. And it's it's unfair to Roman Reigns. It's unfair to everybody else in that match that came in. Aside from fucking Mizdow and, and Ambrose and Ziggler. Two other guys I'm going to get to in a second who the crowd kind of got behind when they came out, gave them a nice ovation. Aside from them, nobody cared. Nobody cared about anybody else in this match once Brian went out. They crapped on the entire match. They never let up. It got it, it, The booze only intensified once Reigns won the whole thing. Who thought this was a good idea? Who laid this match out? It, it wasn't Pat Patterson. I'll tell you that much. Pat Patterson knows how to fucking lay out a Royal Rumble match. I know he was there. They posted a picture of Pat hanging out with Vince and Triple H before the show. Clearly, they didn't bring him into this process. Let Pat Patterson book the whole fucking thing. Even Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston came out. His annual Royal Rumble elimination spot. You never know what. How's Kofi going to avoid elimination this year? This was by far the lamest Kofi spot that we've seen ever in the Royal Rumble. He fell into a pile of rosebuds and they put him back in the ring. Nobody cared. And it was lame. Roman Reigns came out. He got booed. I don't know if that had to do with this this stupid movement that some people started to boo him, which I thought was dumb and I didn't agree with. And I said as much on the show this weekend. But was it that? Was it a combination of that and people still being upset about Brian? I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. But poor guy comes out. He gets just booed to hell. Uh, and it's not even Roman's fault. I, I, I'll, I'll keep saying it. You know, and people may not want to hear it. It's not his fault. Stevie Wonder could see that this was going to happen. But the idiots in the back, they couldn't see that this was going to happen. They clearly had some sense because Rock was there. So they knew why they thought the layout of this whole thing was a good idea. And this would somehow help Roman Reigns. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. We had Kane and Big Show teamed up together in this match to uh, eliminate a whole bunch of dudes. They were the, they were the two big monsters. In this match, you have, I've already talked about Kane and Big Show. I'm not going to rant on it any longer. Uh, it, it's it's just completely foolish to me. We had Dean Ambrose come out. I think he came out at number 25, I think. Uh, we had Dolph Ziggler. Now, I had number 30 for the record in our Royal Rumble Facebook pool, our Facebook group. So uh, last year, I had number 26, which was Ryback, and that didn't end well. So I was hoping number 30. Okay, you know, two people have won the Rumble from the 30 spot before. Undertaker and... And John Cena. Not bad company to be in. When I saw Ziggler come out, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. I actually had a moment of hope. I thought to myself, okay, self, Daniel Bryan is gone. People are extraordinarily pissed off. Roman Reigns is being completely crapped on. This whole match is being crapped on. Maybe there's a method to the madness. Maybe they're gonna come out of left field with another, you know, younger, talented guy that people have kind of gotten behind. And it will erase the stench of how Daniel Bryan got sent out of this match. Maybe maybe Dolph Ziggler in the number 30 spot is going to pull it out. I mean, look, he was the last guy in there at Survivor Series, right? It came down to three-on-one in that match, and somehow Ziggler outlasted Kane, and, and I think it was Harper maybe, and then he pinned Seth Rollins with uh, some help from Sting. He got the big win in the Team Authority versus Team Cena match at Survivor Series. He's been getting a bit of a push lately. Maybe they're going to pull the trigger on Dolph Ziggler. I didn't realistically think it would be him and Brock at Mania. I, not for a second did I really think that was going to happen. But maybe he wins the Rumble and somehow loses his title shot. You never know. And boy, did I feel like a fool. Not only did Dolph Ziggler not win this match. And again, it goes to the same thing I said with Brian. It's not that Ziggler lost. I did not realistically think that Ziggler would win. Dean Ambrose was my dark horse pick, and I didn't even realistically think he was winning. It was how it all unfolded. Dolph Ziggler comes in at number 30. Okay? Number 30. One of the best workers on the entire roster. A guy who the people get behind no matter what. He's a great underdog, but more, more than being an underdog, he just has a way to get people into his matches. People get behind the guy. They like him. And he's been getting a bit of a push lately, right? One of the best workers, though, on the entire roster. One of the few guys I would look at and go... In 2015, if we had an Iron Man match in WWE, there's only a handful of guys I think would do really well and can really pull off an Iron Man match, 60 minutes. He's one of them, okay? He's really good. They bring him out in the 30 spot and literally spent two minutes and change in the match. He spent two minutes and like 10 seconds or something in the Rumble before he got punched out by the Big Show 
and dumped out of the ring like a sack of trash by fucking Big Show and Kane. Here's a guy who also had a story going into this match. Same with Ryback. That, that's the other thing. I talk about stories. Rumble should have different stories, right, going into it. Ryback, Rowan, and Ziggler lost their jobs all those weeks ago. And they built to this dramatic match on Raw last week where John Cena helped win their jobs back for them. Dolph Ziggler was one of those guys. He had to earn the right to even be in the Rumble match on SmackDown last week by beating Wade Barrett, the Intercontinental Champion. Well, that was easy enough. Champs are chumps, right? So, fuck Wade Barrett. He beat Wade Barrett easily. And Dolph Ziggler got his spot in the Rumble match. You would never know that there was any sort of build-up to it. You would never know there was any sort of story going into it. He had Diamond Dallas Page had more time in the Royal Rumble than Dolph Ziggler. Think about that. Let that sink in for a second. Diamond Dallas Page had more time in the Royal Rumble match than Dolph Ziggler, who actually had a story going into this match. Number 30, he comes out, he spends two minutes in there, he gets dumped out. Literally, picked up like a sack of trash and dumped over the top rope. Same with Dean Ambrose. Dean Ambrose comes in number 25, one of the few people who came out after Brian got dumped, the people reacted to him. They wanted to see him win. Let's go Ambrose, they said. Ha ha, fools. He got knocked out by Big Show, picked up, gently tossed out of the ring, falls to the floor. And that was exactly what I had feared going into this Rumble match. My, my, my biggest fear, one of my biggest fears, was that it would come down to Roman Reigns and the Big Show. That kind of happened here. Not exactly, but it kind of happened here. It was down to Big Show and Kane, of all freaking people, with Roman Reigns. Now, Rusev had never been eliminated. I completely forgot about him. He was on the outside. He did come in later on, and, and Reigns speared him and dumped him out of the ring. But people were not happy when Roman Reigns won this match. And somewhere in here, he got bloodied up. His mouth got bloodied up. I don't know what happened or how it happened. Uh, if it was sympathy blood that he smeared on his face in the hopes that people would, would feel sorry for him, but it didn't work. So Roman Reigns wins the Royal Rumble, and you know things are bad. Before he won, because I guess some people could see Rusev laying on the floor. I couldn't see him. You know it's bad when the crowd starts chanting, We want Rusev. They were chanting for Rusev. The Russian sympathizer who hates America. And they were chanting for this guy at the end. So Roman Reigns wins. The Rock came out to save Roman from a post-match beatdown by Kane and Big Show. So the Royal Rumble pay-per-view ends with The Rock beating up Kane. He gave him the people's elbow. He gave the Big Show a rock bottom. I thought it was 2000 all over again. And they had The Rock raise Roman's arm. His his cousin, Roman Reigns, raised his arm to endorse him like, like he did with John Cena at WrestleMania 29 at the end of that show. And guess what happened there, too? The people booed. Well, this was even worse. The people booed even louder. And the funniest thing of all, if you watched it, you know what I'm talking about here. They show The Rock holding up Roman Reigns' hand. The crowd is booing. They can't be any angrier than they are. And The Rock has this almost stunned look on his face. Like he's surprised. Like... Hmm, this is not supposed to be happening. Why are you people so upset? <laughs> Somebody hasn't been paying attention, apparently. Probably because he got that call at the last minute that said, Hey, Rock, we really need you. Please. We'll, we'll, we'll commission the jet. We'll fly you to Philadelphia. Please get your ass down here. One of the lamest Royal Rumble matches I've ever seen. I, I can't sit here and say it was the worst, because there have been some really god-awful Royal Rumble matches. I'm not prepared to sit here and tell you it was the worst, but it's way up there. Uh, when it was over, it was more a feeling of frustration than anything else. You should never feel frustrated when you watch a, a TV show. And that's how I felt when this was over. On a show that had that awesome triple threat match, it ended on a sour note. And, and that really sucks. And I look at the Rumble match and I still shake my head when I think of the guys they had in that match. And what the final three or final four could have been. You know, I mean, you are going to get that reaction no matter what. If Brian was losing, the people would not have been happy with Roman Reigns. I, for example, I don't think if Daniel Bryan got eliminated, let's say, in, in favor of Dean Ambrose, or even in favor of Dolph Ziggler as this, this wild card favorite who happens to pull it out, I don't think you would have gotten that same kind of reaction. So I, I can't sit here and say that anybody but Daniel Bryan winning and the place would have, you know, booed. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think there were a, a couple of guys they could have had in there at the end that maybe... Uh, could have swayed the reaction, but 
if it were up to me, and I know Monday morning quarterback, but I watched this and I, I was convinced that it was going to come down to Daniel Bryan, Roman Reigns, uh, maybe Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt. Some combination of those guys. I thought Wyatt would, especially the Iron Man thing he was doing in there, throwing guys out left and right. I thought Wyatt would be in there uh, closer to the end before he got dumped. Uh, but to have Brian in there with Reigns at the end seemed like a no-brainer to me, if for no other reason, because one thing I really liked about this Rumble match going into it was you had the element of doubt. You didn't know for sure who was going to win this match. There were two reasonable choices of who could have realistically won this thing this year. Normally, there's only one. Usually, it's so predictable. Ah, we know who's going to win. It's so obvious who's going to win. This year, it wasn't so obvious. And that's what I really liked about this Rumble match. It could have gone, realistically, it could have been Reigns, it could have been Bryan. Either one of those guys. Now, can you imagine, if it came down to those two guys, how crazy the place would be going? And yes, when Roman Reigns, you know, dumps out Daniel Bryan, they're going to boo. They're going to boo a lot. But at least the finish of the Rumble will be the only part of the match that people crap on. Instead, instead, you booked it in such a way where they crapped on more than half of the Royal Rumble match. Good job, guys. Good job. Nice work. All those guys that went in there that were working, that were busting their ass, and the people didn't give a shit, and they were booing. I mean, a guy could have been in there putting on the performance of a lifetime, and those fans would not have cared one iota. It, it's not just that they crapped on the fans and gave us what I thought was a a poor Rumble match, they crapped on the talent, because those guys never stood a chance. At least if you would have saved Brian for later in the match, whether he was the last one out or not, final, you know, final four or five, whatever, they only would have crapped on the end. You would have had a mostly really good Royal Rumble match with with an unpredictable finish. Who's going to win? Holy shit, it came down to the only two guys that have a realistic shot of winning. Let those guys go at it in the final sequence, a good five minutes back and forth. You know, and then Brian gets dumped out. I mean, hell, if you're so concerned about getting Roman Reigns over as an ex-Golden Boy, then you get Daniel Bryan back in the ring when the match is over, looking all dejected and upset. You don't know what he's going to do. And instead, he extends his hand. He shakes Roman Reigns' hand. He grabs Roman's arm, holds his arm in the air, and he endorses Roman Reigns. Instead of trotting The Rock out there to do that, take Daniel Bryan, your top babyface, and let him endorse Roman Reigns. Now, the people would still boo. Maybe some of them wouldn't. But the people probably would still boo. But why not do it that way? Why get rid of the guy so early? And and run the risk of them ruining for the second year in a row. You ruined your own Royal Rumble match. It's not the fans' fault. See, as the promoter, as the booker, you need to know how to play the fans. You gotta know how to play these people like a fiddle. Vince McMahon apparently has lost his musical touch. He can no longer play the fiddle. He doesn't know how to do. He doesn't know how to do it apparently because that's two Royal Rumbles in a row now that have been fucked by poor decision making. Now last year they had to change plans and things worked out in the end. I don't see them changing plans this year. I think they're set in their ways. They're stubborn like that. They've got their guy and fuck everybody else. But unfortunately, it made for a very poor Royal Rumble match that far overshadowed the three way. For the championship. And then we had post show. When the show was over. We had the uh, setup For what I guess will be. The long rumored match. Which is John Cena and Rusev. Coming up at Wrestlemania. And uh, and I love by the way. you know, Because this has been rumored now for a while. On the torch. And the observer. PW Insider. You know all, all those key guys have been saying this for months now. That the rumors have had uh, Rusev in the spot against John Cena at WrestleMania this year. And you'll always have people who say, ah, oh, it's the dirt sheets. It's the dirt sheets. They don't know what they're talking about, except when they do. Uh, which is not to say they're always right. But it was those same uh, supposed dirt sheets, by the way, who first floated the name Bray Wyatt as an opponent for John Cena a year ago. And I remember that because people were, were emailing me going, this is bullshit. You know, they're saying Bray Wyatt, it doesn't... Of course, Bray Wyatt is not wrestling John Cena at WrestleMania. John Cena is going to have a match higher on the card. Well, as it turned out, we had John Cena versus Bray Wyatt. So they were right again. Uh, Cena's backstage cutting a promo. Rusev comes from out of nowhere. He starts cutting a promo into the camera. He had the audacity to interrupt John Cena during his promo. And then they went head-to-head. They had to be separated... So the story here to set up their WrestleMania match appears to be 
You interrupted my promo. I'll see you at WrestleMania. Grrr. Great story. The last opponent I wanted to see Rusev have at WrestleMania was John Cena. But you know what? I was thinking about this. I slept on it. Thought about it some more. That's the thing I've, I, I'm the least upset about coming out of this pay-per-view. Because at least that means that John Cena will not be in the main event of WrestleMania this year. Or, or defending or fighting for the WWE Championship. So that's the upside. The, the, the silver lining in the cloud. Got to try to look at some positives here. You got to pull positives out of somewhere here. So that's a positive. And we had the three Stooges on commentary back at ringside before they went off the air talking about how this Royal Rumble match lived up to expectations. JBL said it was awesome. They must have been watching a feed of the uh, 1992 Royal Rumble match on their monitors. And they didn't realize it the whole time. And that's, you know, the 92 Rumble, before we wrap up here, the, the, the 92 Rumble, which anybody who listens to my podcast knows, I've said this time again, is my favorite Rumble match of all time. It is the best booked Royal Rumble match they've ever done. And it had the added benefit of being for the championship, which was vacant. So that added a whole element of drama to it. Because it wasn't just, oh, you win, and it doesn't mean anything. Because back then, they didn't have the stipulation that the winner of the Rumble went on to WrestleMania. That didn't start until 93. So the Rumble match really didn't mean anything back then. But they had the title on the line, so it meant that much more. Uh, that's a great example to use. And, and not, you know, I don't want to hear, well, it's, God, oh, you talk about all these old matches. That's old. That's old school thinking. It's really not. If you look back at that 92 Rumble, what made it so great? Besides Bobby Heenan's commentary. I mean, think about what made that 1992 Royal Rumble match so great. Right? It had a predictable finish. I I'm pretty sure at that time, you know, a lot of people kind of figured Ric Flair was going to win. I mean, I look back on it now, and it seems pretty obvious. I don't, I don't know how obvious it would have been to me as a, as, as a kid back then. But it had kind of a predictable finish to a lot of people. And a guy won who, you know, he wasn't exactly a young up-and-comer. He wasn't even a WWF guy. He was a WCW guy. So you would think to yourself, what makes that Rumble so special? Predictable finish, old guy wins, you know. But it was in how the Rumble was booked. Flair was kind of the main focal point, right? He came in at number three. The story was, this guy's not going to win. Nobody in the history of the Royal Rumble up to that point who had drawn one through five ever won the damn thing. That was the story they told from the moment Flair walked out to the ring. Heenan's on commentary, having a coronary. He's practically having a stroke on commentary, and Monsoon is needling him the whole time. But think of all the guys that came into that Rumble match who went right after Ric Flair. All the guys that Flair tangled with in that match. Even a young Shawn Michaels. Kerry Von Erich, which of course they didn't mention this, but there was some history there from you know their NWA title matches back in the 80s. So even those two guys, not, not in WWF, but they had a history. Flair and Piper. That was one of the best moments of the whole Rumble match. When, when Flair is the only one left in the ring in the middle, and the buzzer comes down, and out comes Roddy Piper, who had his own story. Piper won the Intercontinental title earlier that night. He was going to try to win the WWF Championship. Even Roddy Piper had his own story in this match. Piper had a beef with Flair. He's beaten the hell out of him. Felt like everybody who came in that match went after Ric Flair. He was wrestling with Savage, of course, with Hogan. Savage and Jake Roberts hated each other's guts. That was when they did the whole snake bite thing, and, and Jake had smacked Elizabeth in the face. So when Savage came out, he was like a crazy man looking for Jake. Jake was hiding outside the ring. There were so many little stories that were intertwined in that match. And then the finish which was awesome. Hogan, who was so overexposed to the uh, the WWF audience at that point, when he got dumped out, they cheered <laughs> to the point where when they aired a replay of this on TV a few weeks later, they actually dubbed in boos with a new commentary track. But uh, you can't fool the fans. I mean, he got booed when he got dumped out. Or he got cheered, I should say, when he got dumped out. And then Hogan, the big crybaby that he is, tries to yank Sid out. And then Flair from behind, and he wins the whole thing. So a, a very memorable finish. But you look at a Rumble match like that, that's a good, well-booked Royal Rumble match with a ton of stars, one of the most star-studded Rumbles they've ever had. And it just made sense, and it told a good story. And it felt like lots of different guys, they meant something. Everybody had a role in that match. Everybody who should have had a role, an important role, in this Royal Rumble match 
got fucked over in in the story you know in the storytelling they got fucked over daniel bryan had the best story of the bunch he got dumped early dolph ziggler had a story he got dumped two minutes in dean ambrose didn't really have a story but you could argue some people may have thought he might win i mean the guy has gone from being practically the fucking son he was so hot to a goddamn ice cube Think of, think of where he was in August, September, and where he is now. They didn't do him any favors in this Rumble match either. So to me, that was the most egregious error on their part. It, it was the booking of the Royal Rumble match. It has nothing really to do with who won and who lost. Yes, I'm upset that you know Daniel Bryan didn't win, so we're not going to get that match between Brock and Bryan at WrestleMania, which is a match that I think would have you know tore the house down. It's a match I would have loved to have seen, and I'm bummed. I'm bummed that we're not going to get it, maybe ever, especially if Brock leaves after WrestleMania. I doubt it'll ever happen. But it's not so much, oh, Daniel Bryan lost, so therefore we're going to rant and rave because our guy didn't win. I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for everybody else who's complaining about the show, and there are a lot of people who are. I was more offended by how shitty they booked the Rumble match itself. It, it just seemed like such an easy thing in terms of what you do with some of the key guys in there, regardless of who wins. And they built no drama. There was no drama to it at all. You always want to have drama. You want to make it fun. You want to keep people guessing. Who's going to win? I don't know. And they did every single little thing they could do wrong. They did. There was no drama at all. The crowd crapped all over it. And it's all their fault. Because they allowed it to happen. By getting rid of some key guys when they did, how they did. They did this to themselves. Don't blame the Philadelphia fans. Blame the Philadelphia fans if these rumors are true that they were blocking wrestlers' cars in the parking lot at a protest when the show was over. And I don't know if that's true or not. Every now and then you'll get some bullshit fan report, you know, from the arena about something that never really happened. I haven't heard if that was corroborated at all, so it may just be nonsense. But if that was true, that that's complete bullshit. And you've got to be really fucking stupid i think to do something like that it's not their fault first of all it's entertainment not that it's always entertaining but at the end of the day it's a fucking show that doesn't give you the right to go out in the parking lot and block someone's car or deface their car or or anything like that but it's also not their fault why would you hold the wrestlers accountable for the dumb decisions that their bosses make you know i mean vince mcmahon comes out of the arena in his limo block his limo even that would be stupid I'm not even advocating that. But like when I heard those those reports, I just thought to myself, I hope this isn't true. Because if it is, that's pretty effing stupid. You know what I mean? I mean, that that's taking it too far. The best thing you could possibly do, and I, I checked again, and the hashtag cancel WWE Network is still trending. I mean, me personally, I'm not canceling the network just because I'm upset with how they booked this Rumble. Because it's it's not the first time they've made a booking decision that just made me shake my head. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are canceling their network subscription. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I still think the value is there for NXT, if nothing else. And I know NXT is on Hulu. I don't know that Hulu has the NXT live specials. It might. It might. That might be a solution for some people if you want to get rid of the network. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But I will say this. If you are somebody who is very upset and wants to send a message to WWE... More than just complaining about it on Twitter, that's probably the best thing you could do. Is cancel your network subscription, if you have one. Hit them where it hurts. And I see Time Magazine on their website picked up the story about the uh, the cancel the network hashtag. I mean, that's, that's not the kind of publicity that WWE is hoping for. That's the best way to send a message to them. Hit them in their wallets. Hit them where it hurts. Those network subscriptions are so near and dear to them. They're trying to drive their numbers up. They still have this three to four million steady stream of subscribers uh, that they're that they're talking about. I don't know what orifice they're pulling these numbers out of, but they still maintain within a few years we're going to have a steady stream of three to four million subscribers. They can't even get a million. If you're that upset by not just the rumble, but just things in general, the booking, the general direction of things, that that's probably the best thing you could do. And send them a message. Are they going to get that message? Does that mean they're going to change their plans? Probably not. These are some of the most tone-deaf people I've ever seen in my life. And it would take a lot of people, I think, a, a, a groundswell to really make an impact. But that might be the best thing you could do. But more than anything else coming out of the Royal Rumble, I'm just disappointed.
because I was expecting a lot more. I said it on the podcast yesterday. I'm pumped. I said I was I was excited. I was looking forward to the Royal Rumble. And kudos to John Cena, Brock Lesnar, and Seth Rollins. And uh, that's the biggest shame of all because of stupid, poor decision-making on the part of the people in charge. One of the best matches maybe that the company has ever had is overshadowed by something that never really should have happened in the first place. You can follow me on Twitter, at Solomonster. There is a lot going on even today. As I am recording this, uh, there is a huge snowstorm that is about to uh, literally bury all of us here on the East Coast to the point where uh, Monday Night Raw, which is supposed to be in Connecticut tonight, is in jeopardy. Monday Night Raw, for the first time, is in jeopardy of being canceled, uh, which I guess technically happened once, you know, with the uh, with the Benoit stuff. I think they ran a a three-hour Benoit tribute when that happened, but I can't think of any other examples of times that Raw has been canceled, not not due to weather anyway. And it, uh, I don't know that the final decision has been made yet as I record this, but Raw may not happen tonight. SmackDown, the tapings tomorrow night in Boston appear to be canceled, so there's a lot going on today. Follow me uh, on Twitter for more updates on that. You can listen to the full episodes of this podcast on thesolomonster.com. We have uh, a weekly show that drops typically on Sunday afternoons. It also... Uh, you have a feed, you can get it on iTunes, you can get it on Stitcher Radio, uh, where we are number one on the sports charts, or TuneIn Radio. So lots of different ways to get the sound off if you've never heard a full episode before. Check it out, I think you might like it. Probably more than the Royal Rumble this year. So, until next time, we'll be back very soon with a brand new extra here on this channel. Please hit the subscribe button if you have not already done so. That way when new reviews like this one and other videos go up, you will be alerted about them. So please subscribe, and uh, that's it. We'll be back very soon with a new one. Until then, take care, guys.